what, what we said um, yesterday is as Paul looks at why I live the way I do in the culture in which he lived, he said the first one is this assurance. This profoundly affects me. Um, I have a worldview that gives me an assurance that it is worth it all. Okay? And that's in verses 1 through 8. He also says one of the reasons I live the way I live and I live my life with the, the intentionality and the intensity that I do is secondly found in the idea that I have this accountability placed upon me. If you're in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 9, he writes, therefore, we make it our aim. You, and I love how the word therefore, and he's building now as he did verses 1 to 8. But 2 Corinthians 5, 9, therefore, we make it our aim that whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing. Now, present or absent is because there's something about this life and there's something about what's going to happen after we pass and are absent from this body, present with the Lord. For we must all appear, and so he takes us there first because it follows to be pleasing to the Lord. We must all appear before the Bema seed of Christ that each one of us may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God and also trust are well known to your consciences. For we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our half that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. For if we be beside ourselves, it is for God, or if we are a sound mind, it is for you. Paul here is developing, and we won't have time to develop it fully for us exegetically with the time we have, but what he is doing in verses 9 and 10, this is page 15 of your notes, in verses 9 and 10 of 2 Corinthians, he is saying, I live, I, I am willing to invest my life completely to the cause of Christ because of there's an, a day coming when I will be made manifest before the Lord. And the word manifest is the term that was used in, this, in the Septuagint, the Old Testament, of taking a sacrificial animal. And when they did take an animal to be sacrificed, they actually grabbed the lamb and bent the head back, and then they shed the blood. Do you know what I'm saying? It was completely laid bare is the Greek word. Or we would use the term, and if I could use it today in colloquial speech, because it literally has this kind of an idea, to be turned inside out is the idea. You take cloth and you turn it, and it means that nothing is unexposed. You see it for what it really is on the inside. That's what manifest is, okay? And at the judgment seat of Christ, the idea is we will all and it's not, well, I think I'll show up. It's a necessity. On an individual basis, he goes, we must all appear that each one of you, everyone, conducted by Christ before that beam of seat for the things done in the body, it's of practice, not position. Okay? We must all appear before the judgment of Christ to be made manifest to appear. And by the way, as I said, it's of practice, not position. I, was, I grew up as an early Christian being discipled by the idea that one day all of, our, all of us are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ and he's going to bring us one by one up here and then our life is going to be made manifest. It's as if God's going to bring a big screen and you're going to see your life flash before you at the Bema seat and other believers and, 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 and that's the blessed hope. Huh. If the blessed hope is for you to see everything about my life brought up on a screen, I ain't showing up. Okay. It's like, who came up with that nonsense? Okay. And I called it what, theologically? Nonsense. Because you won't find that in Scripture. All right? You will not be judged for your sins when you die. You're never going to see your sins again, ever, ever. Where were your sins judged? Where were they left? Right there, okay? 
What will be judged is the things that you've done in the body. The Bema seat's all about your life lived for Christ. Okay? And fellowship or what could have been wood, hay, stubble or gold, silver, precious jewel, valuable or invaluable. Reward, some of us, they have their reward now to be seen of men. Greek word theatikos. They wanted to praise the theater of men. And by the way, what does a bema seat look like? Do we come up one by one? When people tell me that, I go, dude, that would take forever, okay? <laughs> We've got to get back. There's a marriage supper happening, and I don't want to be late, okay? <laughs> Have you ever sat in a room like this and we all kind of pray silently? How does he hear our prayers? He can hear them all at the same time. God can do stuff like that. Could he judge us all at the same time? Sure, why not? Okay. So he can do that. And by the way, when does the judgment seat happen? After the rapture. That's my, been my answer. Although I'd hate to have died 1,500 years ago and having just this great time in heaven, only to know it's going to be a real downer 1,500 years from now. When You know what I mean? Does it happen for each one of us to be absent from the body and then to be immediately what? Does it make sense? I've not seen a lot of doctoral dissertations on it, but somebody ought to write one. Okay. It's been too easy just to put one sentence there, you know. There's probably more to it than that. So our life is being manifested before the Lord, and it's being made manifested right now before others. Does it make sense? They're watching. It's called salt and light which takes us to the last section with this we close. As you look on page 16, what we believe and why it matters, and we'll touch more about this tomorrow morning, but what you have on page 17, Paul says, I live the way I do, not only because of the assurance, not only because of the accountability, but also because of the accomplishments. Now, if you notice in the notes, they get more complete as we go, okay? Why? Because I know me, and I know how I speak, and I know about these rabbits, and I know that they've gotten big, and I know this, that you can take this now with you and read it because I'm not going to, okay? Paul does say in these, for the love of Christ constrains us, means holds together. I've been wrapped. There's something that's reached around me and grabbed me. Why do you live the way you do? The bottom line is, do you know what he's done for me? I'm not trying to earn his favor or trying to repay him. I never could. But if somebody loved me that much and everything in the future, 34 gazillion years from now, is based upon what he did for me, you can better believe it. I'm going to give him 30, 40, or 60 years of my life. Like my dad would say, what's wrong with you? After all you've been given, what's wrong with you? Where's your head? So I talk like a German would back home. My dad would. Where's your head? What are you thinking? It's like, I don't want to say that to people. What are you thinking? What are you thinking? Nothing. <laughs> awesome. But it really is nothing. I mean, there's no spiritual thing. That's what Paul is saying. He changed us. See? We're new creatures. He reconciled us, meaning the relationship with God where I was at enmity, I'm at peace. I've been restored with God. I am in Irene, spelled Irene. It means at peace with God. He loves me. And what's even cooler, he not only loves you, he actually likes you. He likes us. Peter, do you love me? Yea, Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yea, Lord, you know I love you. You know I agape. Peter, do you even phileo me? Do you even like me? Yeah. 
The Lord likes us. He delights, it says, when we come into his presence. He, that, that's fun for him. So did you fun up with him today in the sense that he just had time with you to have fun? See, that's what Paul is saying. This, I do this because this is just cool. I take you into some heavy-duty theology on what this, what Christ did as a substitute, propitiation, a reconciler, and a redeemer. Those are not all the same terms. They meant he did everything. He took your sin. He carried it away. He brought you into with God, and you're no longer on sin's auction block. You're not a slave to sin. You can live completely differently because of the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same power that took that dead body out of the grave, Ephesians 1.19, now lives in you. That is a holy cow. The resurrected power that raised him from the dead lives in me. And I say, boy, I don't think I can overcome that. Oh. Anytime we think that just shows that our theology is about as shallow as water spilled on that table. And frankly, aren't you growing tired of shallow Christianity in our churches? You have a Bible, we have the Holy Spirit, there is no excuse, none, not a nine, nothing for us to be shallow. And you and I are accountable for every truth, every single truth in the Word of God. Everything. We're to be living it all. It's called the law of Christ. The Old Testament believers had to follow 613 different rules. You and I are under more the law of Christ. We never preach about it, talk about it, whatever, and we're going to stand before the judgment seat and he's going to go, ahem, I gave you a book. Okay. And you could have had it on your iPhone because you have the Bible on your iPhone. Okay. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Two negatives, two positive. That the man of God, the woman of God may be what? Completely, thoroughly furnished unto what? To what? All and what? Good works. Our conduct, our life in this culture. So in a sense, I've done that for you. I guess I could put it this way. I used to have a plaque in my office. I asked Jesus, how much do you love me? He stretched forth his hands and said, this much. And Paul says, that's why I live the way I live. Amen? So that's it. Read through the rest of it, and uh, um, we'll touch on more of this tomorrow, dealing with doubt in this day, that, uh, a day of doubt. Now, I ask you a couple of questions, and then we're going to wrap up. We'll take just five minutes or so, and some of the questions we may try to deal with today, others, then that'll give us food for thought to deal with tomorrow as we preach. And tomorrow, I'm in a very limited time because we have two services, and I'll see if I can bring no rabbits with me, and we'll be in a wonderful position. But anybody have any questions about some of the stuff we've covered in, in, in our study? And I'm going to take this and step down there as we try to answer some questions. So, who might have questions, we'll ask. And I may not even answer them. We may deflect them to the pastor and say, you got it. But uh, <laughs> what, as, we as we wrap up, are there some things or comments or whatever that we can say that helps us as we take on the culture and the world in which we live? Okay. Yes, sir? Hello. All right, my name is Philip. Um, so, to kind of get this in a nutshell, um, I do believe that um, because of the, the free will, um, God is actually giving and playing into the will of the people as a culture and what they want. And, uh, and Lucifer is their God, so fine. 
you don't want me, you reject me, and I'm going to give you what you want. And so I think on, on that uh, premise, you have the, um, the young people um, becoming gods, so you can tell me what to do, where to go, what to wear. If I want to look like a clown and act like a clown, and I'm going to be a clown, and um, you can't tell me where to go to the bathroom, et cetera. And I think that's what, pretty much in a nutshell, through my independent study of that, you know, this is what we're facing with. And it is the, uh, <clears throat> the responsibility of those who are um, true, faithful stewards, wise stewards of Christ, to um, hold up that morality of what is godly and what is not godly. And so um, church as a whole kind of like fell, fell into that culture and, and there's no really correction and, and reproof and, and rebuking. It's just go along with the, uh, the mainstream. So. Uh, uh, and you know, you know what, in, in answer to that, I, I, I agree. And I, and I think even in 2 Timothy 3, for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, righteousness. And I like what you're saying. There is a sense in which we are called, as uncomfortable as it is, to call people to see themselves and their blindness. Uh, I wanted to quote, and if I have the opportunity tomorrow, I might. There's a book that you all ought to have for your, for your bookshelves. Uh, it's a Christian counselor, taught for years up at, in, in Philadelphia. His name is Paul David Tripp, okay? Paul Tripp has a book called New Morning Mercies. How many of you have it? Okay. If you don't have it, you must buy it, okay? It has 365 readings. Some of you have heard of the old piece called The Daily Bread, and what is important is this is a, you can use it over and over and over. But Paul Tripp, first of all, is a theologically minded man and writer and counselor and pastor and preacher. And I, I'm, I'm coming to a point here with it. New Morning Mercies, I think Crossways publishes it. Jim, I'm not sure. I think it's Crossway. Okay. Buy it has a green cover on it. I was going to read five or six readings from it particularly April 13, 15, 17, and 24. I wanted to read. But what he drives home in a couple of those is he talks about our spiritual blindness and we need to confront it. Here's the problem. I love his phrase. Paul Tripp uses it. We are blind to our blindness. I use a burgraphism. People today don't even know that they don't know. Okay. They don't know that they don't know. Others don't care. Like they said, I am my own God. Okay. And that's what happens when you took God off the throne already in the Middle Ages and we put ourselves there. Self-autonomy. But Tripp keeps bringing that. And you are blind to your own blindness and the only way you'll ever see the light is by the grace of God. Okay. Everything we have is by the grace of God and the power of God that lives in you. Okay, good comment, thank you. Yes, Jim. Following that up a little bit, Dave, uh, in, in dealing with the culture, and dealing with the people that are coming at you, uh, they're not too interested in what we have to say. And, and we probably uh, don't wanna be the moral authority or the agent of change in their life, but we do wanna build a bridge to be able right. to, gain that access where faith comes by hearing and hearing through the Word of God, where the Word of God is going to stand forever. And what I'm hearing you say uh, for us to engage our culture is that we, we need to be testimonies of God's grace, and, and we need to live that out in, in this dark world. And as God opens that door of opportunity for us to share the Word of God, which has the power to, to, to break into people's hearts, so don't be afraid, I, is my challenge, is don't be afraid to share God's word, not as a weapon to beat people over the head, exactly. but to engage them to share the beauty and the power of God's word where that 
convicts people of their sin. Exactly. Every one of us is alive and is given gifts and abilities and experiences and situations and circumstances by a sovereign God. And we need to uniquely be salt and light wherever God has placed us. Number two, there are men that God and women that God has placed in political places and whatnot. We need to be behind them, support them, and pray for them so that when the laws of the lands are being altered, they know that there are people behind them praying because our government and others, they work by what? The pollsters and everything. But we don't even write them. We don't even contact them. We don't even call them. We just say, well, somebody else will do it. If you've ever watched American Idol or The Voice, people get on by the millions in text and vote and whatnot so that their favorite singer receives the award, okay? What's wrong with us? We don't even do that much. We could help people who are on the firing line by letting them know we're praying, we're voting, we're texting for them, okay? We have time for two more, and then we'll wrap up, okay? Ever. Just just on the same line, you know, we, we probably as a group know more about the starting quarterbacks of each individual football team in the NFL, maybe That's not good. all of us, but then, then we do the people that run our state or our government. And uh, I've talked to some of those people, and they assume for every letter they get, there's 60 people that feel the exact same way that just aren't going to write. So there are opportunities to to get in and speak to them. And unfortunately, most of them are just going by the they, they, they just want to keep their job, That's and right. they are just trying to figure out, what does the majority want me to do? So if we're silent, then uh, they're going to race to whoever's making the most noise. Yeah. Politics won't change America, but I'll tell you what, somebody's got to say as Christians, enough is enough. Okay. And if you do decide to pass that, you're doing it over our dead bodies, which may be the case, but we need to say that. Any, there was another question in the back yet? Yeah, well, thank you, Pastor Jim. He kind of touched on, on it. Um, my question is, I'm in the public schools, and my doctorate is in education, but it's not leading me anywhere. Because do you think it has anything to do with the separation of church and state? You know, we hear that all, and I don't want to make excuses, but exactly how can we proceed with this? Uh, uh, we, uh, the answer is going to take more time, but le were you here last night at all? Yes. When I read, okay. Sure. Let me encourage you because he's got about 12 or to 15 chapters in his book on just that and on education and on our school system. Dr. R. Period, Albert Moeller, M-O-H-L-E-R. You need to buy his 2013 volume called Culture Shift. Go on Amazon today and order it, Culture Shift. You'll get it for about $10, paperback. Read what he says about our school systems. It's, he's got several chapters on it, and it is what we can do relative to that, as well as his, the other book, uh, No More, the other one. Get both of those. I quote Al Mohler because he makes them both very practical, Okay. And get those two by more. And, and that'll help you as much as anything that, because you want to take more to read the history of it. If you're in education, you are on the front lines of what, where we're doing stuff on weekends and whatnot, you're dealing with it every day, front lines, probably more than anybody, you need our support. And you need the wisdom that he can give you through some of those chapters. You. Okay, you're welcome. We have to wrap up. Um, if you have any other comments, we, we need to close. I promised I'd be done because there are appointments that have to happen at 12 o'clock, but we're done now. Can you stand with me, have a word of prayer, and then we'll be on our way, please? Yeah. Father, thank you for our time together today. Lord, we're looking forward to your coming. And uh, there were actually some worse times, no doubt, in John's day. Uh, as he watched what was happening in the Roman Empire. And so as he writes his revelation of just what's going to come and how the Lord will have complete vindication when he does come, we would say with John, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But in the meantime, may we be found faithful, people of faith, not of doubt and discouragement, but people who live with the runtas, confidence in our Lord and in the promises of the Word of God. Thank you for each one who gathered today on a busy Saturday taking this time to be part of this 
Bible series, conference. Pray that the things that we've covered would be useful and helpful and strengthen us as we seek to live for you and glorify you with our lives. May they be a sweet-smelling savor in your nostrils. And would you be pleased with us so that one day we would hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's a desire of our hearts. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.